So take your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 18, the passage that Devin read just a few moments ago. That's going to be our passage today. And I want to pause today. We normally have been having a prayer time because of so much in our service today. We didn't take the time for a prayer time, but I want to take it now. And so I just kind of like to ask you to bow your head and your heart. And you've probably already done this during the service, but ask the Holy Spirit of God to speak to you. Um, be honest before Him. If there are any unconfessed sins in your life, now's a great time to confess those. And just ask for God in a way that only He can to speak to your hearts today. Let's pray for just a moment. Lord, we recognize your presence with us today. Lord, I rejoice as I look out and see so many faces that I know and love. And I'm so thankful that they're here today. I'm grateful to see faces that I haven't seen before, new people that are here. And we're so thankful that they're here with us. But most importantly, we're thankful that you're here with us today. You promised us that when just a small group of people gather together, that you are there. So God, even though we can't see you, and or maybe feel you and touch you, we're grateful that you're here today. And I pray, Lord, that you would encourage us. I pray for those that are here that are discouraged, Lord, maybe struggles going on in their life. I pray that they would find encouragement in you today. Father, I... I pray for those that are broken or maybe going through a difficult relationship or a financial crisis or maybe a health crisis. I pray that you would minister to them today. I pray for those who are searching today. I pray that today they would find the truth. Lord, I, I pray for all of us. Give us a tender heart. Lord, help us to have ears to hear and a heart that listens today and we thank you we believe with all of our heart that your word is going to do a work in our lives and so we ask that your word would speak to us word of God speak in a powerful way and we thank you for what you're going to do and it's in Jesus name we pray amen so no doubt all of us have heard the fateful story of the Titanic right I have a picture of the Titanic that we're going to put up this morning. Built in 1912, the Titanic was dubbed the largest and at that time the most luxurious ocean liner in the world. It's interesting. So we live in one of the ocean liner capitals of the world, and they say that the ocean liners that are in our points are in our ports ports today dwarf the Titanic, but in its day, in 1912, it was the largest and the most luxurious ocean liner. It left Southampton, England on April 10th of that year, 1912, bound for New York City. Four days into its crossing, 9,673 miles from its destination, the Titanic hit an iceberg. Most of us know the rest of the story because we've watched the movie, right? We've all watched the movie. Remember Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet, you know, out there on the, the bow of the boat doing that? We've watched the movie, and so we have an idea of the rest of the story. Of the 2,200 passengers that were aboard that ocean liner, only 700 survived. And it's interesting. You can go read and Google it. They didn't have enough lifeboats. They didn't have enough life jackets. They never imagined that they would crash, and they never imagined that they uh, would sink. But in less than four hours, that massive ship that was thought to be unsinkable uh, sank. We know the story of the Titanic. Did you ever wonder, though, what happened to the iceberg? Lots of times we think about the Titanic, but no one ever thinks about the iceberg. I mean, the Titanic weighed 45,000 tons. Certainly, as the Titanic slammed into that iceberg, it must have destroyed the iceberg, 
right? Wrong. There's no record of the iceberg ever sinking. As a matter of fact, most believe that the iceberg survived the crash. Actually, here's a picture of what is believed to be the iceberg that sunk the Titanic. Ships arrived on the scene just a few hours afterward, and this was the only iceberg in the area. And if you could see it in color, there are stripes of red paint that are along the side of this iceberg. You look at that and you think, good grief, that doesn't even look that big. It doesn't even look as big as the Titanic. How could the Titanic sink and that iceberg survive? And the simple truth is this, the iceberg survived, and obviously it's not survived today. It's It's not in the Smithsonian. You can't go to the Smithsonian to see the iceberg that sunk the Titanic. By the way, there's an interesting story of the history of that iceberg, where it came from. It came from Greenland, how it had broke away, and it arrived in that area of the ocean where it would hit the Titanic. But the simple truth is that the the iceberg survived the collision with the Titanic because what was under the water was larger and stronger than what was above the water. As a matter of fact, as we look at that picture, we're only seeing a very small portion of the iceberg. They say that the depth of that iceberg was profound. And it was the depth of the iceberg that allowed the iceberg to survive the crash with the Titanic. Now think with me today, our series is not about the Titanic, it's not about cruise liners, it's not even really about icebergs, all right? That same truth, though, applies to our lives. It it is the lack of spiritual depth that causes individuals to spiritually sink. But let that sink into your mind. That's not a play on words, I didn't mean to say that. Let that sink into your mind and, and, and heart, all right? It is a lack of spiritual depth that causes individuals to spiritually sink. You you may look good on the outside. You, You may look good above the water. But the question is this, not how good do you look this morning. And quite frankly, I look out over the crowd, and this is a good looking crowd today. But the question is not how good, how well, how beautiful you and I look above the water. But the question is this, does your underlying faith, is your underlying faith strong enough to survive the shipwrecks of life? Let me ask that again, that's a a profound question. Is your faith strong enough? Is it deep enough? Is it profound enough to survive the collisions of life? So let me ask you this morning, are you the Titanic or are you the iceberg? Because the simple truth is, you will have a collision in your life. There are things that are going to crash into your life, unexpected things that come out of nowhere in the middle of the night that crash into you. Do you have enough spiritual depth to survive that kind of crash? Today we begin a four-week series that we have simply named Unsinkable. As we've already mentioned several times, and this is so cool, we are not the only church preaching the series. Many churches throughout South Florida this morning are preaching the exact same thing. More than 30 churches this morning across Broward County are preaching the exact same sermon series, and more than 45 churches in all of South Florida are preaching the exact same messages today. You say, Brian, why would we do that? Well, first and foremost, we want to demonstrate unity. We believe that God blesses unity, and and we've been doing ministry independently far too long. And as churches, we're beginning to realize what would happen if we would lock arms for the sake of the gospel. And we would realize in South Florida, there's really not, there really are not hundreds of churches. There is one church, which is the church of Jesus Christ. 
and we would come together for the sake of the gospel. But our purpose in preaching the series is to tip the scales. It's to tip the scales. You say, Brian, what do you mean by that? Well, Barner Research has estimated that only 3% of the people in South Florida are considered to be committed Christians. If you're interested in how he got that, we can talk about that later. It's not even, the bar is not even very high. There were seven simple questions that he used to come to that conclusion. But we sat back as pastors and thought, what if we could double that number? What if in the next 12 months we could grow from from 3% of the population of South Florida to being 6% of Christians? And then then we could grow to 9%. And and then maybe we could grow to 12%. Sociologists tell us that whenever a population reaches about, or whenever a certain demographic reaches 12% of a population at that point, they can begin to impact change in their culture. We've been called to make changes in our culture for the cause of Christ. So we want to tip the scale. So over the next four weeks, we're going to talk about four core truths. The first truth we're going to talk about today is this. It's truth. What is truth? We're going to talk about it. Where does our truth come from? Next week, we're going to talk about God. There is a God, and it's not you. (laughs) There is a God who is the center of the universe, who is worthy of our worship. The third week, we're going to talk about gospel. The simple truth is this, you and I need to be rescued. And that's where Jesus comes in. Because Jesus comes in and rescues us from ourself. He rescues us from our sin. And the last message is going to be mission. You are part of a larger whole. Sometimes we sit back and we think this is church. This is not. This is one local expression of the church. But you and I are a part of a larger whole. The church, the body of Christ. And as members of the body of Christ, that means that we are on the greatest mission on the earth today. That greatest mission is not to be a success in our jobs. That greatest mission is not to accumulate a lot of money. It's not to live comfortably. That greatest mission is to be the living examples of Jesus Christ in our community. Just a few moments ago, Devin read the passage that we're studying today, and I'm not going to go back and and read all of the verses that Devin read there in John chapter 18. Here's a synopsis of the verses that we read. Jesus, earlier in the chapter, Jesus has been arrested. You can go back and and read this during the Dolphins game today. It's probably going to be a little boring during the game, so you might want to find something else to do. So you can read this later on. And so in the first part of John chapter 18, Jesus has been arrested. They're in the Garden of Gethsemane as he's praying. You know the story. The Roman soldiers arrive and They arrest Jesus. Peter's already denied Jesus as we come to the latter part of John chapter 18. You know, Peter had said, Lord, I will never deny you. I'm willing to give my life for you. And three times, Peter denies the Lord. Jesus has already appeared before the high priest. And he's already appeared before Pilate, the governor of Judea, once. As you read through the chapter, you notice that Pilate wanted nothing to do with Jesus. As a matter of fact, after Pilate interviewed him the first time, he kind of just gave Jesus back to the Jews. And we'll see in just a few moments. The reason for that is Pilate didn't see any guilt in Jesus whatsoever, but the Jews insisted. They actually looked at Pilate and said, no, no, you're the one that has to condemn him because according to our laws, we can't kill him and you can condemn him to death. So now as we come to verse 33, Jesus appears before Pilate the second time. Pilate finds himself in a difficult position. As I've already mentioned, he knows that Jesus is innocent but, but, but as the procurator is the governor of that area, he also knows that he has to keep the Jewish people happy. He knows that the security of his job 
is to keep riots from taking place and to keep the Jewish leaders happy. So I'm not sure whether you can feel the tension that's taking place there in the chapter in his mind and heart. He knows that Jesus is innocent, but pragmatically he knows he has to do something or riots could ensue. So beginning in verse 33, there's the second conversation between Pilate and Jesus. And Pilate looks at Jesus and he asks him the question, are you the king of the Jews? Now, from Pilate's perspective, that was a political question. Pilate wasn't asking a spiritual question at that moment. He really was a little bit worried for his job and was wondering what he was facing. And so he looks at him and he says, listen, are you the king of the Jews? Tell me. Are you my political rival here? Jesus, his answer is equally political. I love Jesus' answer. He looks back at him and answers his question with a question and says, are you asking this for yourself? Or did someone else tell you that? In other words, he's asking him, Pilate, are, are you really wanting to know who I am? Or are you simply asking because people have filled your head and told you who I am? Pilate at that moment responds with sarcasm. He looks at Jesus and, and scoffingly, I'm not sure whether you can read it in the passage, but scoffingly he asks the question, am I a Jew? And then he looks at Jesus and basically says, listen, you must have done something to aggravate your people. And he asks him, what are you guilty of? What have you done because to make your people want to kill you? I love Jesus' response. Jesus looks at him and says, my kingdom's not of this world. In other words, he looks at him and says, you know what, I'm no threat to you. My kingdom is not of this world. And he actually says it's not of this world, nor is it from this world. Then he makes this great statement. He says, and by the way, if I wanted to, I could reach out to my father and he could send thousands of angels to rescue me right now. Don't worry, my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus' answer intrigues Pilate. So Pilate pushes. He persists. And he says, so you are a king. That's where we pick up, I want you to see in verse, verses 37 and 38. Then Pilate said to him once again, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world. Notice what he says. If you underline in your Bibles, you have a, an old-fashioned Bible in your hand, you can underline it. He said, for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to, notice what he says, to what? The truth. Everyone who is of, what does he say? The truth listens to my voice. And Pilate looks at him and he asks this question that not only resonated then, but this question that kind of echoes down through the corridors of time. And he looks at Jesus and he asks him, what is truth? You say that, that you speak the truth, that everyone who listens to you follows the truth. Jesus, what is the truth? If you have your outlines, that's the first point in your outline today. What is the truth? And as I've said, that question resonates down through the corridors of time it, it, it was a question that was not only relevant to Pilate. It's a question that was not only relevant to the people of, of Pilate's day, but it is a question that is equally relevant today. As a matter of fact, you and I could pick up the paper today and we could see the question, what is truth? Who is the possessor of truth? Where does truth come you and I know that truth or the source of truth that is something or is something that has been up for debate for some time. In our postmodern culture, truth has been what they say deconstructed. And so what in the past has been accepted as true has now been deconstructed to the degree that no one really knows what truth 
is. As a matter of fact, many have questioned, is there such a thing as absolute truth? It's one of the big questions of postmodernism. Is there such a thing as absolute truth? And many today have come to the conclusion saying there is no such thing as absolute truth, which is quite ironic because making that statement is an absolute statement. And it's hypocritical. They say there is no such thing as absolute truth, and in their minds they're stating an absolute truth. Yet we live in a day and age in which truth is being debated. Our culture has come to the conclusion that What is true for one person might not be true for another person. I have my truth, they proclaim, and you have your truth. You can believe what you want and whatever you believe is truth for you, but that doesn't necessarily make it truth for me. Truth, they would argue, is what you and I feel on the inside. Your feelings determine what is true. They would even say today that your feelings dictate your reality. Your reality is determined not by any absolute truth that that exists out there. Your reality is determined by what you feel on the inside. And that's manifested in a variety of ways. It's manifested in human sexuality. It's manifested in gender identity today. It's manifested in right and wrong. It's manifested in religion. People sit back today and say, listen, truth for us is this. It's what you and I feel. Our feelings dictate our reality. Let me, let me take just a moment and try to illustrate that and take that to its illogical conclusion today, if I can. So um, how many of you have a map app on your phone? So you either use Google Maps or you use Waze. Matter of fact, let's just do this. So how many use Google Maps? You use that, all right? How many use Waze? All right, Maps have it. Maybe because we're a little bit of an order crowd. I don't know. I use Maps. I don't use Waze. But, but is it remarkable in this day and age that we can type in an address and it will take us right to that spot? Does anybody remember when there was this thing called maps? You, you, you know, you would go to the store and you would buy a map and you would unfold this map and you would try to figure out how to get from one place to another and you would have to track your route on this map. I joke, you've probably heard me say it before, Vicky and I lived in Mexico City for 10 years, and oh my word, Mexico City at that time was the largest city in the world, and we had maps of Mexico City that was pages after pages of it. And people used to ask us, how did you learn your way around Mexico City? We didn't have, we didn't even have cell phones when we went. And so we tell them very simply, well, we got lost, and then we got lost, and then we got lost, and then we got lost, and we got lost, and one day we realized I've been lost here before. I know how to get home from here, all right? But, 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 but in this day and age, we were in Guatemala City not long ago with my son and his family there. And man, we're in Antigua, which is one of the oldest cities in the Western Hemisphere. And he's got ways opened up showing us how to get through Antigua. All right, we can get anywhere. So let's imagine today that you needed to get to your doctor's office. And so like me and like you, you typed in the address on Google Maps, or you typed it in on Waves, and all of a sudden, it told you what? It told you how to get there. Take a right here. You're going to go for two miles, and you go two miles. Take a left here. Oh, no, there's an accident up here. Let me give you a different way. And it tells us how to get there. And we follow this external source, which is our phone, and it tells us what? It tells us exactly how to get there, right? Are you with me? All of us do that on a regular basis. But let's say that I do that, I have a new doctor, I do that the first time that I go to the doctor's office, but I'm going to the doctor's office a second time and I'm like, no, I don't think I need that. I I think I know how to get there now. And and Vicky might look at me and say, aren't you going to map it? No, I'm, I'm pretty sure I can feel my way there. I'm pretty sure I can. So we get in a car and 
we exit our neighborhood, and I'm like, okay, I think I need to take a right here, and we take a right here, and then we get out on the main road, and we're going there, and I'm going by feel, and all of it feels right, and, and I feel like I'm heading to the right location, and I feel like I'm going right, and all of a sudden I get to this building, and it feels like it's the right place. And I walk up and I knock on the door and I say, I'm here to see my doctor. This is his office. And they look at me and say, no, it's not. This isn't where his office is. And I look at him and say, no, but you don't understand. It it, it is because when I left my house, I had this good feeling that I knew how to get there and that I could find my own way there. And And we followed each time we turned this way and we thought, yeah, that's right. And then we turned this way and we thought it was right. And this is where our feelings led us. This must be where my doctor's office is. They would look at me like I'm half crazy and say, no, you're not. Why don't you map it? All right, why don't you do what? Why don't you grab an external source and use an external source to tell you how to get there. Does that make sense, church? Are you following me today? You see, the simple truth is this. Here's what I'm trying to illustrate, whether it was good or not. Here's what I'm trying to illustrate. Your heart will lead you in the wrong direction. For us to be led by something internally will not always lead us in the right direction. As a matter of fact, Jeremiah said this in Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things. It's desperately sick. Who can understand it? So so, so, so the, the, the point that I want us to get, if you're following along in your outline, is this. Truth is not found inside of you. Truth is found outside of you. So, 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 so what you feel, what you believe on the inside might not always lead you in the right direction. As a matter of fact, often it's going to lead you in the wrong direction. Because we have a depraved soul, because we have a depraved mind, because we need to be rescued, we cannot trust ourselves. We desperately need an external source of truth. So follow me today. In today's passage, Pilate was confronted with the truth. And when Pilate was confronted with the truth, that truth that was in front of him was not a philosophy. It was not a way of thinking. The Pilate with whom, or excuse me, the truth with whom Pilate was confronted was and is a person. That's the second point in the outline. The first is what is truth. The second is this. Jesus is the truth. Let me remind you what Jesus told Pilate in verse 37. He said this, For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world. To bear witness, read it with me. What does he say? To the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice sat back and thought this, how ironic that the very one standing in front of Pilate is himself the truth. (laughs) Pilate asked, what is truth? Where is truth? And there was the truth standing right in front of him. I would remind you what Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 6. Many of you can quote it with me. Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You see, here's what we must understand. Jesus is the source of truth. Jesus is the very embodiment of truth. All truth comes from him, and all truth agrees with him. Anything contrary or anything contradictory to Jesus is not the truth. Sadly, though, many people like Pilate, when confronted with the truth, don't recognize it. They're confronted with the truth, and they fail to see 
the truth that is right in front of them. Can I ask you today, how do you respond when you're confronted with the truth? Do you ignore it? Do you reject it? Do you want to change it because it differs with what you think or it differs with who you are? Jesus simply saying, I am the truth. So here's the second reality to that. If you're following along, it's this. If Jesus is the truth, we cannot make up our own truth. Does that make sense? If Jesus is the truth, We can't make up our own truth. The simple truth is this, and it's not a play on words, but the simple fact is that many people today do not like God's truth. They hear God's truth and God's word, and they don't like it. It offends them. It goes against what they believe on the inside. And so instead of allowing the truth of God's word to change them, they have opted to do what? to change the truth, to walk away from the truth, to say that truth doesn't apply to me. Brian, that might be good to you, that might be good to other people, but you know what? That truth offends me, and so I do not want to accept and I do not want to embrace the truth. And by the way, that's happening not outside the church, that's happening inside the church. One of the things that we as pastors have seen is that, as I mentioned, and I've thrown these statistics out to you before, 3% of South Florida would, would fall under the criteria of being a committed follower of Jesus Christ, answering the questions that we gave to you today. Seven questions that we gave to you today. Only 3%. But as you survey the people of South Florida, 77% of the people of South Florida say that they're Christians. And 42% of the people of South Florida say that they are committed to a local church like ours. So as pastors, we've sat back and realized, oh my word, those numbers just don't make any sense whatsoever. 42% of our population say they attend a church like ours on a regular basis, and yet only 3% of people are adhering to the foundational cardinal doctrines of the faith. What's happening is that many people in our churches, maybe some of us here today say, I love HCC. Brian, you're a really good pastor. You're really cool. You're all of that. Somebody could have said amen at that point. He said, said, I like like the worship. I like what Jonas does. I love Brad. I love all of that. I just don't hold to any of those. Those are things, quite frankly, that we are not making up. They're things that are found in God's Word. You see, the simple truth is this. Jesus is saying, I am the truth. Truth is found in Jesus. If Jesus is the truth, you and I do not have the right to make up our own truth. As I mentioned today, many people do not like God's truth, so they've determined to make up their own truth. Here's what we see. We don't have the right to make up our own reality. God's truth is found in his word. So, so, So I found this week in part of my study, I found I believe there's 60 verses in the Bible that have the word truth in it or in them. So I went and read every single one of those 60 verses that talk about truth. And I'm not going to read them to you today, but let me just mention two of them. Isaiah 49 and, or excuse me, 45 and verse 19. The Lord says this, I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right. John chapter 17, verse 17, sanctify them in the truth, Jesus said, Your word is truth. So we find Jesus sitting back saying that truth is found where? It's found in him, and truth is found in his word. That's where we find truth. So the first question is, what is truth? The second point is this, Jesus is 
the truth. And here's the third thing I want you to see this. The third is this. Jesus as the truth does not restrict you. Jesus as the truth sets you free. You see, truth doesn't bind us. Truth doesn't handcuff us. Truth doesn't hinder us. Truth sets us free. I put in your outline, many erroneously believe that the truth hinders them from being who they want to be or who they were intended to be. But nothing could be farther from the truth. You see, they fail to realize that the things that they want freedom to do are the very things that enslave them, are the very things that puts them in bondage. Listen, church, we see it on a regular basis. Almost every week here as we see people walk through our doors who in their mind wanted to experience freedom, but they have no freedom at all. They're bound to the things that they wanted freedom to do. So they come in and they're handcuffed and they're bound to alcoholism and they're bound to addiction and they're bound to improper relationships and they're bound to lustful thinking and they're bound to materialism and they're handcuffed and enslaved by all of these things thinking at the end of the day that it was giving them freedom when in reality it wasn't giving them freedom. It was imprisoning them not realizing that freedom is not found in any of those things, but freedom is simply found in Jesus Christ. We see that, we see that all the way back in the beginning, in the Garden of Eden. From the beginning, God gave us freedom. I want you to see a verse, and I, wanna, I want you to see it from a different perspective. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 16 is the very first time that God speaks to man. So you know the story, he had placed Adam and Eve there in the Garden of Eden and, 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 he, and he had made this luxurious garden for them and he places them in the Garden of Eden. And Genesis 2.16 is the first time that he speaks to them. And he says this, I'll read it out of the ESV and then I'll read it differently. It says, and the Lord, command, the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree in the garden. I love the ESV, but what the ESV doesn't show that's found in the Hebrew is there is a, uh, there is a declaration of freedom that is there. The NIV translates it this way. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. Here's what God tells Adam and Eve. I've made this beautiful creation for you. There are all sorts of trees and all sorts of fruits and all sorts of vegetables and things that you're going to absolutely love. Why, you have freedom to eat any of those things. You are free. I give you freedom. But with the freedom, there is one restriction. Be careful of the one tree. Be careful of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And yet we have taken that restriction of that one tree and at times if we're not careful, sat back and thought, see, God is restrictive. He wants to keep us from doing things without realizing, no, 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 that's not what God intended. God intended us for us to be free, for us to freely enjoy everything that He has created. You see, here's the principle, church. The more, you la- the more you wrap your life around the truth, the more freedom you will have. The more you wrap your life around the truth, the more freedom you will have. I bounced over a really important verse. I want you to see this. We can go back. Sorry about that, guys. In John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. Here's what Jesus said. We studied this verse as we looked through our baggage series just a few months ago. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth. And notice what he says, and the truth will what? Set you free. Would you say that with me again today? The truth will what? Set you free. Say it one more time. The truth will what? It will set you free. You see, the more you wrap your life around the truth, the more freedom you will have. Paul says it this way in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, for freedom 
Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Let me ask you today, have you experienced the freedom that only Jesus gives? Are you here today and you've experienced the freedom from sin and you've experienced the freedom from guilt and you've experienced the joy and the freedom that is found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? That's what God desires to offer you. Believer today, are you living in the freedom that comes from being a follower of Jesus Christ? One final question let me ask you today, and it's this. What determines, what determines truth for you? So as you sit back and examine your life, what determines truth for you? Are you guided by your emotions? Are you guided by your feelings? Are you guided by your innermost desires? If that's careful, if that's the truth, be careful because it will lead you down the wrong path. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12 says this, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end is what? It's the way of death. It's not the way of life. Or are you guided today by something external? Are you guided by the Bible as God's source of truth? It's my challenge to us, our challenge as leaders, Lord of Hollywood Community Church, and our challenge as leaders of churches all throughout South Florida is this, is to recognize the Bible, God's Word, as the source of truth. And as we recognize the Bible, God's Word, as the source of truth, we let God's Word shape our minds. We let God's Word shape the way we think. We let God's Word shape our desires. We let God's Word shape our actions. And yes, we allow God's Word to shape our relationships. I become the husband that God wants me to to be because I follow the principles of God's Word. I become the wife that God wants me to be because I follow the principles of God's Word. I become the parent God wants me to be because I follow the principle of God's Word. Listen, I get it. It may clash with our impulses at times, but it will ultimately set us free and it will ultimately set you free let let me end by just looking at the last few verses because in the last few verses we see just a beautiful description of the gospel let me read verses 38 through 40 once again Pilate said to him what's truth who knows truth what's truth after he had said this he went back outside to the Jews and told them I find no guilt in him He's innocent as far as I'm concerned. There's no guilt there. I find no guilt. But you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? We have a custom. I'll release anybody you want. Jesus, there's no guilt in him. Do you want me to release him to you? And Notice their cry, their response. You know it. They cried out again. Not this man, but Barabbas. Release Barabbas. (laughs) And in an anticlimactic way, John makes the simple statement about Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. (laughs) Do you see the contrast? Here's a man who was a robber, and by the way, he was not only a robber, He was a traitor to the nation, and he not only was a traitor to the nation, he was a murderer who had been arrested for tyranny, who had been arrested for conspiracy, who had been arrested for all sorts of crimes, who was guilty of death. And Pilate looks at the crowd in front of him and says, listen, I'm letting you choose. I can release Jesus, the King of the Jews, to you, who's innocent. I find no guilt in him. Do you want me to release Jesus to you? No. Give us Barabbas. And we find Barabbas, a condemned killer, was set free. And Jesus, an innocent man, was condemned and killed. You and I read that and we think, how atrocious is that? 
Barabbas was not the last condemned person to be released in the place of Jesus. Because the simple truth is this, you're Barabbas and I'm Barabbas. You sit back and say, hold on, Brian, I'm not a robber, I'm not a murderer, I know that, but every single one of us are guilty before God. Romans chapter 3, for all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Verse 10, there is nobody just, there's nobody perfect, no, not one. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of our sin is death. All of us are guilty before God. All of us are Barabbas. All of us are condemned. All of us are guilty of death. And here comes Jesus, the one in whom was found no fault, the one who is innocent, who steps up and dies in our place. At the end of John 18, we find a beautiful description of the gospel. I'm reminded of Paul when Paul says that, maybe thinking of this, Paul says, the just for the unjust the perfect for the condemned. That is the gospel in a nutshell. And today, man, we want you to know if you are here today and you have never recognized your need of Jesus Christ, you've never recognized that you're a sinner and as a result of your sin, you're condemned and you've never recognized that God in his love looks down and loves you and cares for you, and sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to die for you. And by faith, realizing that he took your place. And by faith, you receive him into your heart to be your personal savior. That is the gospel. And we put all of this in perspective. The truth, dying <laughs> for that which is untrue. So we started the message asking the question, are you the Titanic? Are you the iceberg? How, how, how deep is your faith? Is your faith strong enough to survive the shipwrecks of life? In order to survive, you've got to have a sure foundation. You've got to have a truth, something that you can hold on to, something that is stronger than you. Allow that truth to be Jesus. Would you stand with me today with your head bowed and your eyes closed? Jonas and the team are coming. Would you do a little bit of personal inventory today? Who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? Is he the truth? Was he just a great prophet who taught some great things and gave us some good instruction? Or was he who he claimed to be? The incarnate Son of God. Truth embodied. Absolute truth for us. Has he changed your life? And if you're here today and there's never been a moment in your life when you've repented of your sins and you've reached out to Jesus as the ultimate source of truth, as your Redeemer, as your Savior, would you do that today? In your heart, would you do that today? You can do it right where you're seated, just a simple prayer. Lord, I realize that I'm a sinner. I confess my sin. I repent of my sin. And by faith, I turn to Jesus Christ. If you've never done that, I'd encourage you to do that. As a believer, would you examine your source of truth? Church, let's not let the culture affect what we believe. Quite frankly, I'm afraid at times that the culture has more impact on the church than the church has on the culture. And we're allowing the culture to determine what we believe instead of allowing God's word to determine what we believe. Allow God's word to be the truth of your life. Father, thank you so much for your word. Help us to be sensitive today to the Holy Spirit of God. And I pray that your truth would permeate our minds and our hearts. 
I pray that the Holy Spirit at this moment would convince us that what Jesus says in his word is true. I pray if there's somebody here that has never repented and given their heart and life to Jesus Christ, I pray that this morning they would do that. Help us to be sensitive to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.